fantastic. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, through my, my work with clients, we're seeing an increasing question uh, come up over time. That as we look forward to 2030, there's some pretty pressing net zero goals that companies have committed to uh, in order to support the trend to decarbonisation across the world. But at the same time, the world right now is not exactly a simple place to operate in. How can we actually help drive forward our net zero ambitions? Um, and how can we, at the same time, keep an eye on the commercial ambitions as well and make sure that we move forward on both fronts? So let me introduce my panellists. So firstly, we have Ed, um, who's the VP Group uh, te Chief Technology Officer at Natura & Co. And we have Dia. So Dia is uh, Global Head of Climate Aligned Finance at HSBC. And finally, Brad, um, Director of Business Development for AI and Machine Learning at R2 Factory at Rolls-Royce. So if we dive in then, perhaps to the first question, before we even talk about the analytics side, part of the challenge that I hear my clients talk about is knowing where that carbon actually is to prioritize and start addressing. Um, and not least because a number of sectors don't even have visibility of the end to end. It sits either within the suppliers or the customers. Ed, how do you think about that at Natura & Co? How do you start stressing that challenge? Well, we started initially by following sort of the carbon trust model, mm -hmm. which was a series of assumptions made around the products we sell. So you knew the formulation, you knew the location you sold it in, you could make some numbers and come up with a figure that felt reasonable. We started altering that to now think about what we buy. So instead of us thinking about what we sell and assuming, we got some hard figures about what we buy. So we know what we buy and where we buy it from. Now there's still things to be sorted out around finished goods that we buy or some of our ingredients that come from brokers. But in general, we can make now some pretty hard assumptions of we buy ingredient X like alcohol mm -hmm. from plantation or distillery B. So you know some quite targeted stuff around it. And that's a period of progression, but our measurement gets more and more accurate because actually for our accounting purposes, this is something we have to audit because frankly, parts of our bonuses are paid on it and it's part of our integrated profit and loss calculation. So mm -hmm. it's now becoming quite uh, a, the science to so we say push procurement to work with suppliers who can give us exact figures. Dear, if I look at your world mm -hmm. and where the data is. I guess the complication for you is that the question is really about your customers rather than the bank per se in terms of where the carbon sits. Absolutely. And the transition to net zero could be the largest reallocation of capital in history. Uh, according to the IEA, um, investment in clean tech um, could, could reach four trillion per annum by 2030. Um, so for us, this is, this is a, a strategic priority and, and very central to the, to the bank's ambitions. Um, the bank transitions to net zero if our clients transition to net zero. And it's really important for us to work with our clients in enabling that transition and, and making sure that we're able to support and empower them so that they're able to thrive in a, in a just transition. Um, to effectively capture that value, um, we're, we need data and analytics, we need innovation in technology and in finance. Um, and we're, we're starting to, to to pull a, a narrative together around financed emissions, get a sense for at least an estimated baseline where we don't have reported emissions, and then work through the target setting process. But for us to truly capture value from, from this proposition, from this journey, um, we are going to have to work with our clients to understand their transition plans, understand where they are on their their journey to net zero through climate disclosure, transparent, consistent, um, globally uh, consistent with, with regulatory standards as well. That's, that's quite, quite a, an important factor that we consider. Um, and the challenge today is that a not, not a lot of this is, is currently available. Uh, and we're, we're trying to, to work with our clients to encourage this disclosure, but we're also working with peers, industry bodies, regulators, um, to really sharpen the focus on the need for high quality data that's consistent, comparable, transparent, so we can build out the wide range of analytics use cases that we need to put into play at pace um, without rewiring the entire enterprise's architecture through the process. Um, so a lot to do, uh, but we're hoping as a first step that transparency in data and that availability moves a lot forward for us. What are the... Um 
What's easy and hard in that journey? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the, the, the main challenge uh, from is, is data availability, of course, um, but there is a, a challenge around a lot of that data being decentralized, um, structured and unstructured, um, housed in legacy systems and architecture. Um, and we need to access that data at pace, um, at scale, um, because we're starting to get a portfolio view of a company and feed that into uh, monitoring and, and decision-making capabilities from bank steering to um, transaction monitoring. So a whole host of use cases between, between the two. Um, and to do that, we, we do need to leapfrog and, and move forward um, and, and make sure we've, we've got the infrastructure in place to start to centralize these data assets. Uh, and then work through the process of moving from proxy calculations to using real-world data that's as close to the attributable activity that we're trying to measure. So Ed, how do you see analytics coming into play? Sort of where the opportunities for well, Nature and Co? So wave one, as, as I said, was <laughs> let's get the data to something we can access it. <laughs> a lot of it is in legacy. We, we can move it forward. Was establishing for us essentially was a, was a cadre of, of data scientists who could work in common ways. Mm. Be it in sustainability, be it in operational stuff or, or, or sort of pricing promo and assortments. Mm -hmm. Secondly, was actually making some sort of architectural decisions we made our systems. One of which is carbon for us is data. Yeah. Unless we can measure it, the carbon might as well be just any figure. So it, it making some pretty fundamental statements that our carbon problem is a data problem. Therefore, let's start with the data first. Mm. It's the conversation we were having in the green room was, is basically, do you have data or are you just making it up? Um, <laughs> <laughs> is, 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 a, is, a, is, is a fundamental thing. It gets you away from, I think I feel. It allows a conversation to be had about data and therefore that provides a level of understanding to our executives that the implications of the analytics can be trusted. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm taking away that data engineers and architects are going to be the unsung hero of decarbonizing, yes. <laughs> <laughs> which is amazing. Um, and also just the importance of bedding into the processes, right? The day-to-day -day decision making mm -hmm. and ensuring that the trade-offs are transparent and clear. And then finally, collaboration, mm -hmm. I guess, was your point, Brad, of how do you well, and, and Ed also, right? How, how do you actually think about different parts of the supply chain coming together? Yeah. yeah. Um, and sharing, I guess, in the first instance, but... Yeah, for sure. I think we talk about how complicated things are, and, it, and it's true. These are very complex problems with lots of noise in the system, and sometimes it's very difficult to make predictions. Um, but when you get more of the right data mm -hmm. in your supply chain, you start to narrow the uncertainties, and you can make better predictions. And then, to your point earlier about making decisions, I know, either your ad said, you know, the, the challenges in making decisions, one of the things that we can do through collaboration and through these tools is create the kind of decision-making tools that executives can make to design their systems to be better, yeah. right? These are, the whole system is man-made, right? We, we have designed and engineered and built everything in the built world. The solution is also at our, in, under our control as well. Mm -hmm. We just need to put in the processes and the right kinds of, you know, priorities to make sure that we're understanding what's happening through that supply chain, to make sure that we're we're making those right decisions. Right now, I think we're 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 at the front end of where many businesses were maybe five or six years ago, Rolls Royce included, where we looked across our business when we were the R squared uh, data labs internally, mm -hmm. and said, if we can bring all this data together, if we can put some tools on the table that can interpret engineering drawings that were on paper or in pre-digital systems, the way we yeah. understand them today. Mm -hmm we can better understand the compl how to make our decisions today, mm -hmm. right? And jet engines are very complicated things, with very complicated supply chains, and they are very safety critical devices that we rely on every day to move people and goods around the world. Mm -hmm. That same ethos, that same kind of understanding of that is exactly what we took away from those lessons learned to apply to build the R squared factory, which is the intention to spread that around other market verticals. So mm -hmm. it's the, nearly half a billion pounds of cost savings and cost avoidance, which economically right there pays for itself many times over. Yep. But now layer on top of that, the impact that we can have by applying these things globally mm. 
to climate change, to reductions of, you know, buying oil from bad actors in the world, in, in all the things that, the benefits that come with it, come through the data, data stream in understanding where things are in the system. Only then can we really apply the tools. Without the data, without the understanding, the tools are guessing. And I think, Brad, you've got a point there as well, because we're seeing that collaboration is, we have to go into our supply chain mm -hmm. to help our supply chain exactly. provide data, because some of these organizations we work with are not data savvy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like the sort of Six Sigma lean type thing. It's, right. it's a form of lean carbon supply chain. Is right. I'm going to have to help my supply chain tell me about the stuff they send me yeah. and how they themselves could benefit from this. So it's, yeah. because that benefits me, yeah. I'm going to have to almost do it with them or even occasionally to them yeah. to get them to do it because I can't swap and change suppliers that easily right. sometimes. Right. I have to work with them. And I imagine that your suppliers range quite dramatically in terms of the scale of company that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's huge. Where they are, the sophistication of their own processes. And, 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 and some of them, it might sound ridiculous, and in the grand scheme of things, possibly a small impact. But some of our suppliers are almost medieval companies that have been sole suppliers of certain spices or, or things. Mm -hmm. They don't think in a data world, but mm -hmm. their impact is cumulative. Uh, and I hear you about the limitations. I yeah. agree. But I think the really interesting piece is this move from there's the use cases within the company, mm -hmm. but then what is that end-to-end -end system view that exactly. you can start building out, you know, modeling your, your data assets so that you can start p putting together the full sort of supply chain and understanding the what-ifs. Right. And again, it all comes back to the point earlier of what are the choices that you have to make and having as robust a fact base as yeah. is available at the time with the limitations in place mm -hmm. um, to actually make good calls given the time horizons that we're, we're looking at. And I, I think because, because the transition and, and that value migration is going to create network effects um, that we need to really start to crystallize and crystallize early. Um, and we, we need to understand where, where we're seeing growth and, and um, cash flows moving in, into certain sectors and, and really make decisions around investment opportunity um, and where we want to try and manage our assets more effectively from a, from a risk perspective. Um, and I think that applies not just to the banking sector, but as you work mm. through uh, the corporate supply chain, you're, you're looking at similar themes coming through um, and being able to truly pull together a, a large volume of, of data that's relatively consistent uh, from across the economy is going to shape that economy-wide transition. And, and without that, it's going to be a, a pretty challenging process in, in trying to build comparability and transparency through it all. Great. So I'm conscious of time. Before I open to the floor, I have one last question for each of you, which is, if you look at the people in the audience now, anyone thinking about oh, their companies approaching this sustainability shift that they need to make uh, with their own companies and thinking about how to use data and analytics in that journey, what would be the one piece of advice that you would offer based on your experiences so far? Do if I maybe start with you? Um, and maybe just continuing with the, with the, with the same theme I was touching on, um, building out that, that infrastructure in, in terms of, of data interoperability and, and the, the architecture to support it all and enable that, that flow of, of information through the wider ecosystem is, is absolutely critical. Uh, and I think regulators, industry bodies, credible industry bodies, have a, have a leadership role to play here. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a huge opportunity uh, to come together and, and start shaping these standards. Mm -hmm. And by opening up that non-competitive data layer, um, it creates huge innovation. Uh, and we've seen that in other sectors, like banking and payments, for example. Um, and, and the opportunity to really start to, to build analytics and, and applications as well. Um, so for me, that's a, that's a key point. Fantastic. Ed, words of advice? I'm going to echo this. I mean, <laughs> without the data, you haven't got a carbon story. So get the data together as soon as you can. Be really clear about your assumptions, where you're synthesizing data, where you can't get it, and work with either regulators where they exist or industry-wide bodies to get agreed approaches that everybody can test and look at. Because in the end of it, the only regulator we're really going to face here is the atmosphere. And <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't really sort of allow us a huge amount of uh, regulatory flex. <laughs> We've got to be real about this one. It, 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 this isn't a market that we can create additional stuff in or trade too easily. So it's going to be stuff like get the data together, 
focus on the architecture and open standards mm. and be clear about assumptions. Fantastic. Yeah. Brad? Um, to augment what was said by my colleagues on the stage here, I think get get going. Um, it, yeah. it, the time the time is now. I mean, I don't think hesitating or waiting for some miracle to happen on your own is going to do it. Um, and it's a team sport. I mean, we we must work on this together because it's a, it's a global problem mm -hmm. that requires a global solution and global thinking. Um, we knew it when we just integrated all this data and all these techniques across three of the main business areas at Rolls-Royce and cut 200 million pounds procurement costs, created 45 million pounds of value in predictive analytics in terms of supply chain management, and I could go on and on. I mean, these are real hard numbers that are in the books inside Rolls-Royce that we're measured on. That can be, imagine if we, if we now worked across our verticals, that, which are huge, banking and, and beauty and aerospace. These are really Sweet. giant impacts on the world, if we work together, then those numbers just had more and more zeros on the end of them, and, and it's just orders of magnitude greater impact. And I think get started, work together, and don't hesitate, just just go for it. Thank you so much for the brilliant, uh, brilliant conversation. Thank you so much to my panelists for all of that insights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.